Well, aren't we blessed with great music every week? Man, we are really blessed. If you have your Bibles today, would you turn to Acts chapter 13? We are moving through this chapter. We hope to finish uh, today, chapter 13. We'll move on to chapter 14 on next week. And I so much appreciate that song because we're going to look today at responding to the Word of God. And we're going to specifically look at there are really two options that we have when we're confronted with the truth of God. We can either uh, receive that or we can discard it. You know, recently Karen and I have been doing some spring cleaning in the fall. And uh, it actually has to do with our basement. And uh, sometimes I can get a little crazy about this stuff. I just take up a notion and I say, we've got, got to get rid of stuff. I don't think and plan ahead for a yard sale or anything. It's like that morning I may think we've got to get rid of that stuff. And by the afternoon, uh, we've got to move that stuff out of there. Now, I'm very scrutinizing, though, about what I discard. In fact, I've got a little bit of meticulousness, I call it something. Some people may call it OCD, but I obsess over not throwing away something that's essential. So I will go through a crate once, I'll go through a box once, I'll go through a crate twice, a box twice, and make sure that we're not discarding uh, anything that is of value. You know, back in 1989, there was a dealer, um, and this was a flea market dealer, uh, that was not so scrutinizing. In fact, uh, this dealer, unbeknownst to her, sold an original copy of the Declaration of Independence for $4. Now, she was not too meticulous because she sold a frame with a picture in it, not knowing that beneath the picture was this original that actually sold for over two and one half million dollars. She sold it for $4 uh, at a flea market. But you know, we make decisions every day of where we're going to keep and where we're going to discard. We do it in the refrigerator. I mean, we look through, we say, hey, is this outdated or did we have this last week? Let's get rid of it, but is this something we can keep? We do it in our closets in the spring of the year, in the fall of the year, when things begin to change. And we say, well, you know, I went through this whole summer and I didn't wear this outfit or this shirt. Next year, why do I keep it? And we may discard it or we may look at it and say, I can see a future use of it. We make these decisions every day. But you know, the Bible says that there's a decision that every one of us needs to make. And that's what we're going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever we're confronted with the word, whether it has to do with the gospel of salvation to believe or not to believe, or whether it's a truth specifically in God's word that speaks to our heart, we have a time of decision. Will we embrace what we are told or will we reject it? Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy and do not sell the truth. What wise counsel that is. When the truth is given to us, we can buy it. We can be takers of the truth and not rejectors or discarders of that truth. And we're going to see today how critical it is that when God's word comes to us, that we need to respond in a way that's acceptable to God. But look with me at Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 42. And in Acts 13, 42, it says, as they were leaving, that is Paul and Barnabas, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. Remember, they had been invited into the synagogue. They were invited into a traditional Jewish synagogue service. They actually preached the word. They were guest speakers, and, and many embraced what they shared. Well, after the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who was speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. The following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, and they began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. 
Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. We're turning to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I've made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, I pray that within the sound of my voice, within the homes of every place in this part of the county, in the state, in the nation and world, that there would be a great turning in belief, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, there is only one appropriate response when the truth of God is proclaimed to us, and it is that we would believe that we would believe in a place called heaven, that we would believe in Calvary and what Christ has done for us. And so speak in this, uh, these moments we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, for the past two weeks, we spent that time looking at Paul and Paul's message, actually the church at Antioch in Pisidia. And we finished that look last week. So today, as we move to verse 42, we're sort of looking at the post response after the message had been preached. We would call it in our terminology, church had been released and dismissed. The benediction had occurred. Uh, then was the time for the people to decide what they were going to do with what they heard. And we'll see today there were takers and and there were buyers and there were sellers. There were those who rejected the message. You know, James chapter 1 verse 21 says that we are to humbly receive the word of God which is implanted, which is able to save our souls. Wouldn't it be great if every time the word of God was preached, the word of God would be humbly received, that word that is implanted that saves the souls. However, the Bible tells us and history shows us that not everyone will believe. We wish that everyone would, but everyone will not. Last week we noted the twofold response to the gospel in Acts chapter 13, and we're going to see it in chapter 14. It's the same truth. Very generally and simply, there's a twofold response. There were those who heard and humbly received it and embraced the word with great joy. There, was the, there were those who felt threatened by the gospel and immediately began to to resist it. The same message, but two differing responses. Well, this morning, I want to look at these two responses. First, we're going to see the bad. We're going to see those that rejected the gospel, those who were working against the gospel. And then I want to close it by looking at those who welcomed the gospel. But more than looking at them and what they did years ago in Acts chapter 13, hopefully look at it in light of ourselves. God, how am I responding? Am I responding favorably when I have a devotion in the morning and you speak to me? Is it just a thought and I close the Bible or the book and move on? Or is that word implanted? Is it taking root? Am I responding if you've never believed on the gospel and you hear the gospel? Are you responding to the gospel? So we're going to look at both responses today. But first, I want to look in our text at those who rejected the message and they were actually irritants to the proclaimed message. And the irritant is something that's distracting or annoying. If you've ever had something in your eye, and I have many times, if I cut grass and I shake up dust or I'm, I'm cutting leaves or mulching, uh, that next day I just feel that there's stuff packed up in my eyes and it's an irritant to me. And so as we look today, those 
the, the, the ones who rejected the gospel, they weren't just individuals who rejected the gospel, but they were actually irritants resistant to Paul and Barnabas' message. And I want to see some truths about their response today. First, the Bible tells us that they contradicted the word of God. Notice what verse 45 says, but when the Jews saw the crowds, now that's not every Jew, there were Jews and there were non-Jews who believed, but these were certain leaders. And when they saw all the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. In other words, here were these men, they came in preaching the gospel of Christ and uh, crowds were being convicted by the Holy Spirit. There was a positive response and excitement in the place and they were jealously guarding what they thought were their people. And so what did they do? When they saw the crowds being filled with jealousy, they began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. In other words, literally in the Greek, it said they were speaking speaking against what was happening. And that's exactly what they were doing. You know, um, they made no room for the word. They discredited the word. And this, this shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us because uh, in the parable of the sower that Jesus shared, remember the four types of soil, the first type of soil uh, was a very hard, beaten down path. And while the other types of soil, at least something began to take root, it said when it fell on the path, there was no, nowhere for it to go into the soil. And so the bird snatched it up. It was a quick response. And so right after uh, Paul had preached here, immediately these people had rejected the word. Paul and Barnabas were the sower. The seed was the gospel they were sharing. But the ground was the hardened heart of these particular individuals and they rejected the word. They contradicted the word. There are people even today that will contradict the word. John shared uh, in our Sunday school lesson today that in many higher institutions of learning, they spend a lot of time trying to discredit the truth of God's word. They try to twist the truth of God's word. They work against the word of God. And so these contradict it. But I want you to see a second thing. That wasn't enough for them. They hindered others uh, from hearing. You know, it is one thing to tune out the word for yourself. Uh, you might doodle while the message is preached. Now, if you're an adult and you're doodling, we probably have problems now. All right. Uh, maybe you fall asleep. Uh, we used to laugh at my dad. Sometimes he sang in the choir and we swore that he would doze to sleep. He said he was just resting his eyes and pondering on the word. So I don't know. You know, he can't defend himself. Maybe he will have done that. Uh, you may be, even as I'm preaching, thinking about, hey, I'm going to eat well today. I'm going to I'm going to relax. I'm going to take advantage of this uh, day to catch up on my rest. It's one thing to not receive. It's another thing to be a distraction, to affect someone else. To, to, instead of just not focusing for yourself, you're nudging somebody else and you're distracting them and you're contradicting what's saying and you're working against. And it's not just a decision that's affecting you, but it's inciting others to do wrong. In verse 50, we see that these religious leaders did just that. It wasn't enough for them to reject the message, but they incited, they initiated the prominent God-fearing women of the city and the leading men of the city. City. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. Uh, they were treading dangerous territory. They were affecting someone else. It is a sad thing when someone affects another. In, in fact, a lot of parents often distract their kids. Their kids are ready to believe, but yet they're holding back their kids. And they say, well, I just don't know if they're ready. Well, they're ready uh, to go out and pitch a ball or shoot a basketball, but we're not sure if they're ready to believe on the things of the Lord. And many parents, they're not doing what needs to be done to facilitate the truth that's taking the root in a child's heart. In fact, a child, we're all to believe with a childlike faith. And, and so as parents, we're challenged as grandparents that we ought to facilitate the truth of the word of God, not doubt it, not work against it. And so we see here that these individuals, they were hindering others who may well have been ready to have moved toward belief. But I want you to see the most dangerous thing, at least in regard to them. 
These individuals who were contradicting the word, who were hindering others from believing the word, they were headed in dangerous territory. They risked the opportunity to hear again. Uh, they had resisted for themselves. They had hindered others. They were in peril. When a person rejects the gospel, he or she never knows if that one will have another opportunity. They may have another chance to believe. They may not. And one sin that everyone should most carefully avoid is the sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus himself said, of all sins that are committed, they can be forgiven except for the sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, if that's a sin, I don't know about you, but we ought to know what that means. And I've heard ministers say, if you are afraid that you have committed it, you haven't reached that point. And, and I would agree with that to an extent. Um, because what we're going to see is the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the sin of unbelief. But I want you to see it's more than just the sin of unbelief. Because in the context when Jesus had said that, he had performed a great miracle. A man who was demon possessed, who was affected in his uh, sight and hearing, had been healed at the hands of Jesus. And people were believing, but there were some religious leaders of that day that said he casts out demons by demons. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Jesus said uh, a kingdom divided against itself couldn't have stood as long. And, and Jesus was saying and expressing that he did it by the power of God. But he was speaking toward those leaders who saw a work of God and attributed it to Satan. And they had so rejected God that they could not believe. Even when a miracle was before them, they refused to believe. The sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and I don't know where that is in an individual's life, but we do know generally it's this. When an individual has gotten to a point where he or she is so resistant to the gospel that that person can't believe. Because if you repent and believe, you'll be forgiven sin. So if you're, if you're guilty of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, it means you've so hardened yourself to the truth of the gospel that you cannot and will not believe. And when a person rejects the gospel once, when a person comes back and rejects the gospel again, in weeks and weeks and months, that individual begins to be desensitized to the Word of God, can become hardened, even antagonistic like these leaders. I want to look at really the twofold danger of not believing when God's Word is proclaimed to you. First, there is the, lo the loss of outward opportunity. Look at verse 51. They, these individuals, as we just saw, they incited the prominent women, the leading men. They stirred up persecution. And so what did Paul and Barnabas do? They shook the dust off their feet and went on to Iconium. What does it mean to sh shake the dust off the feet? Well, Jesus told the disciples, if you go to a place and they won't receive you, they're resistant to you, then you just shake the dust off your feet, which means I'm done with this. I'm moving on to another place. So when we reject the gospel and, and when we do that, uh, we risk missing the opportunity in the future to believe. Going back to the parable of the sower, if the sower is dropping seed and it's on asphalt and it's hard, it's not long before the sower will say, let me find more fertile ground, let me find more soft soil. And so such is the case that if we reject the gospel, we risk that pattern of continually rejecting the gospel and then losing the outward opportunity of even hearing it. They shook the dust off their feet. They said, okay, you've gotten to a point we can't do any more with you. We're going to move on. But there's not only the loss of outward opportunity, there's the loss of inward receptivity. It's just like the gum that you take out of your mouth. You're too lazy to get up and discard somewhere else and you stick it on the bedpost. When it gets out of contact with you, it gets hardened. It gets hardened and it's very brittle and don't put it back in your mouth. One's heart can become so hardened, can be so, become so unmoved by the gospel 
that even if the gospel is being presented, even if the seed is being planted, the heart is unpliable. And a person can get that way. Those that were guilty in Matthew 12, verse 31, or at least close toward being guilty of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit were that way. They were so hardened that they could see the work of God and their rebellious hearts wouldn't receive it. Now we know these resistors today in our text were much closer to that than any of us would want to be. And so the challenge for you today is this, Jesus Christ died for you. He rose again. He lives forever. He's coming back to receive his own. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait to publicly profess him. Don't wait and say, I will do it in the future because we don't know if we'll have future opportunities where God's spirit is striving with us and we don't know what effect that has on our heart that it may, this resistance, even harden it. But I want you to see uh, the good news, though. There, was the, there were those who welcomed God's word as it is, the truth. There were buyers in that day. There were individuals who said, I believe. Isn't it great to see someone believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, last night I was at a, a banquet for a mission organization, and uh, they were baptizing people in South America. They were baptizing people in Central America. They were baptizing people in, uh, in Eastern Asia. And as you would see those baptisms, you would see people from all over the globe, and they barely had enough water. Water. They can, in fact, they, they might have even missed a couple of hairs of getting them wet. But man, when those people came out and whoever was baptizing them gave them a hug and it should excite us when we see people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. These people were excited. The first group I mentioned at the very beginning who believed, the ones that embraced the good news. Look at verse 42. As they were leaving, Paul and Barnabas in verse 42, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. They exhorted them. They were encouraging them. They wanted to hear more. And so I want to look at these many Jews and proselytes and their response and, and what we can glean from them because we want to be like they are. And the first thing is this, they possessed a deeper desire to have a deeper understanding of God's word. And we should. If we've not believed, we should believe and say, I want to know more about Jesus. If we have believed, we should want to know more. It's true for those who initially hear, like here, and it should be the case for every one of us. Even if we've known the Lord for 50 years, we ought to desire to delve in and learn more about the love of God through Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter 1 said, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the path of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but that one's delight is in the law of the Lord. Do you love the word of God? Do you love to hear it preached? Do you love to read it? Do you love to meditate on it? Is it a part of your daily life? This second group here, they were urging them to speak about the matters the following Sabbath, but that wasn't even enough. Verse 43, after the synagogue had been dismissed, in other words, when church let out, they weren't figuring out how long of a nap am I going to get? Who am I going to visit today? They weren't thinking what ball game's going on? Where am I going to eat? Although we all do need to eat. Um, but after they had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. I mean, they walked right out. They, I mean, you can imagine the preacher, the guest preacher leaving out, and they are following him all the way to the car in our day. And, and they were speaking with them, Paul and Barnabas, and urging them to continue in the grace of God. These people had a desire, a hunger to hear the word of God. Last night at the meeting, um, they were sharing and a lot of people want to sound spiritual and this is wrong thought. They say, why do we go to the worlds when there's so many people here that don't believe? 
Well, first of all, that's an unspiritual statement. We go to the world because God calls us to go to the world. We go to the nations because we're called to go to the nations. And if you've ever been on a foreign soil and you've been around believers, a lot of times you see a receptivity, a pliability, an excitement that I'll confess that many times we don't see in our area. And so we're to go here and we're to go to the nations. But we need that deeper desire and we need to desire to take that word to other people. And, and so the wise person will desire a deeper understanding of God through his word. Do you desire that? Or do you feel like, boy, I've been a Christian long enough. I know everything I need to know. Is there a desire every day to go into God's word and say, teach me something, speak to me. But I want you to see a second positive response. Not only was there a delight and an excitement and a desire to know more so much so that they followed the preachers out of the synagogue, but I want you to see that the right response is this, share with others what you've heard or read. I love verse 44. We can make a great um, conclusion. Uh, the following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. Now, how do you think that happened? I don't think there was an email sent out. I don't think the television station sent out an advertisement. There's going to be a great gathering at the synagogue in uh, Pisidia and Antioch. I don't think that uh, somebody picked up the phone and made a mass calling. I think people just went to people directly and said, you've got to come see. You've got to come here. There was an excitement. We talk about so many things, about our ailments, our activities, our family. But do we make time in our conversation to speak about God? Do you talk about God in the workplace? I promise you, if you talk about him, when that uh, co-worker begins to experience some type of strife, some type of, of conflict in his or her life, you'll be one of the first persons that individual will come to. We ought to be meditating on God's word. We ought to be intent in sharing God's word word and that change that happens in us will impact others. We need to be talking about Jesus in our lives. But I want you to see a third response. Not only did obviously they carry forth that word and that's why so many people came the next week, but they also, and we need to allow God's word to transform our lives. God's word implanted that it might bear fruit in our lives. You know, I love those before and after pictures. You see them on the commercials. Too many times, though, I get depressed because I'm still in the before stage. You know, I'd like to be in that after stage. But I would have loved to have witnessed the change that happened in Antioch of Pisidia. You're showing up for a few weeks, same old, same old. People are reading from the Old Testament law and the prophets. They have no understanding. The people are going through the ritual and the routine of it. And then these guest preachers come talking about Jesus. And there's an excitement. The Messiah has come, the real one. There's a building. And so the after is so much greater than the before. I'm sure in verse 48, we could witness that. Look at what it says. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Now, what had happened in, in this setting? Uh, the Jewish leaders had rejected the gospel. We said that the gospel was to come first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. It wasn't to stop with the Jew. It was to go through the Jew. And there were many Jews who believed. That's what the scripture tells us. But Paul said it was necessary that if you, the leaders, reject it, that the gospel is not going to stop. Do you realize that your response will not hinder the advancement of the gospel? In other words, if a person doesn't believe, God God will find a way to continue to move the gospel. You may miss the blessing of being a part of something greater than you. And so the Jews' unbelief did not stop the gospel. They had been made a light to, for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul says in Romans 11 that at that time in the early church that the Jewish disbelief actually served to lead the, the Gentiles to believe. And so the gospel was moving forward. And, and so we see here that these Gentiles received it and they were allowing the word that had been rejected by some 
to actually change their lives. Their after was far greater than the before. And notice the response in verse 48. When they heard this, what? That the gospel was coming greatly to them. They first rejoiced. Hearing that they were chosen to hear more, they were thrilled. You know, what a privilege it is every day when we can open up the word of God and read it and have the freedom to hear the word of our creator, the word of our redeemer speak to us. They rejoiced that they were considered worthy to receive that word. But not only that, they honored it. It tells us in verse 48, they honored the word of the Lord. I had my friend uh, visit last weekend and we were able to eat with them afterward. And I did something I don't often do. I let Kim sit in my recliner. I guess that's because I was a junior and he was a senior and I respected him so much. But very rarely do I give up my chair in my house. So don't come asking, okay? But I gave it up to him to honor him. And um, how do we honor God? We just yield to him. When, when we honor the word of God, we read that word and we say, God, this is what I think about it, but I'm yielding to you. You're the one. When we obey God's word, we're honoring the word of God. I wonder today, are you honoring the word of God? Do you yield? Do you move out of your place and your thoughts and say, God, I yield to you what is rightfully yours? You see, these people honored the word of God. We honor the word when we read it, when we really seek it out to understand it, when we share it with others and we live it through our lives, they honor. And then as the song just before I preached today spoke to, they believed, they believed. That's what verse 48 says. All who had been appointed to eternal life believed. That is the right response to the word of God. <laughs> Believe what God's word says about you, that you're a sinner. Believe what God's word says about Jesus, that he died for you and he rose again and he's coming again. Believe what God's word says about the consequences of sin, but the love of God, the justice of God demand punishment, but the love of God sent Jesus, the grace of God sent Jesus to the cross. There's something very interesting that I don't want to jump over, but in verse 48, it says, all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. I don't have time to talk about election and free will in depth. We'll do that another time, but let me put it this way. No one can be saved apart from the initial pulling of the grace of God. In fact, I, I talked with a friend one time and said, I'll live my life the way I want to. When I get to the end of my life, I'll just believe then. Well, no, you don't dictate that. And so it's very interesting here. What was God's plan? God's plan was that the gospel not stop with the Jews that moved to the Gentiles. So here he's saying these people were appointed to believe. It was determined from the beginning that the gospel would not stop with the Jews, but it would move forward to the Gentiles. And a person can't just decide, I think I'll believe today. It takes the drawing of the Holy Spirit. So when we go and share Christ, not only do we pray for that person we're sharing with, but we pray to God, God move and stir that person's heart. But there is a human response, and that is believe. They believe the gospel. Simply put, the gospel for these individuals, this group that believed, was real to them, and they were buyers. They said, we're all in. I wonder today, if you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, why not? What is your reason? Are you not yielding your life? You're not honoring the word of God to you? You're not yielding your life to him? Or are you living your own life? Let me tell you, you don't want to risk one of these two things that can happen if you continually reject. There may become a time when that seed will not be planted. The sower will move on. There may be a time when even if that sower is there, your heart is so hardened, they would not be receptive. Today is the day to believe. But if you've trusted Jesus, let me also ask you, how are you responding to the word of God? 
Do you still love that word of God? Do you have the desire that's spoken these first two verses of our text, verses 42 and 43? Do you delight in the word of the Lord? Are you learning more and more? Are you sharing it like they were inviting others to come? The wonders of his word are timeless. It may be today that you need to get back into that word that feeds your soul. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, as the disciples said, Lord, you have the words of